February 25th, 2011, I sat in the audience at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum at an event honoring the late Congressman Tom Lantos, who survived the Holocaust as a teenager in Hungary. The featured speaker was Vice President Joe Biden, who told a story about his meeting with Slobodan Milosevic in the 1990s. He had, upon emerging from the meeting, he gave a press conference and Vice President Biden said quite famously, when a state engages in atrocity, it forfeits its sovereignty. Retelling the story at the Holocaust Museum years later, Biden recounted that he faced a lot of criticism for making that comment. But he said that the first call he got was from Congressman Lantos, who said, quote, keep it up, Joe. Biden was talking about the 1995 genocide of more than 8,000 Bosniak Muslim men and boys in Srebrenica. Uh, he had no idea, nor did we, when he was making those comments, that only one month later, the Syrian revolution would begin. And 10 years after that, uh, we would be living in a world that saw over 500,000 innocent people killed, millions of refugees, millions of internally displaced people, tens of thousands of civilians in custody today, being tortured today in Assad's dungeons. We have an expert panel to discuss the path forward, and I'd like to invite them up to the stage now. We have with us today Kutaiba Idlibi, who is the official representative to the United States of the National Coalition for Syrian Revolution and Opposition Forces. We also have Ambassador Fred Hoff, who teaches at Bard College in New York. Uh, he left government in 2012 after serving briefly as an advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on political transition in Syria. And his attempts to mediate peace in 2009 to 2011 between Syria and Israel are the subject of his forthcoming book. And we also have Naomi Kikoler, the director of the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Welcome to you all. I'd like to start with you, Kataiba, and um, uh, you know what we hear in Washington and the conventional wisdom has been is that, oh, Syria, it's so sad, but there's nothing we can do. Uh, we have a bias in our policy towards inaction rather than action. And we often tie the options in Syria to some of the failed interventions of years past without recognizing the important differences in the situation today. So let me ask you directly, what does the Syrian opposition want the United States and the international community to do? What is it calling for? What can we do now to help? And what should the objectives be? Sure thing. Thank you, Josh. And thanks to the Holocaust Museum, the M. Night, um, Shaman Foundation, the uh, Syrian Emergency Task Force, and their partners for putting this together. Um, today, as um, you know, Antonio Guterres, the general, said today that um, Syria is a real nightmare today. Um, and it is in real and I, you know, a never ending nightmare throughout the last decade. Um, as we speak today, 80% of the Syrian people are in poverty. Um, over 12 million people suffer from food insecurity or lack of access to clean water. Um, 2.5 million children are, are out of school and over 13 million people are displaced either in, inside the country or outside the country. Um, and that is more than uh, half of the Syrian people. We are here today, to be honest, um, because of two promises. Um, one that was made by the Assad regime at the beginning of the uprising in 2011, and that is Assad or we burned the country. Um, and Assad has de delivered on that promise. Um, the regime avoided change by using chemical weapons, by using systematic torture, and by indiscriminate bombardment that turned whole cities into rubble and several hundreds uh, thousands of Syrians dead. The other promise was made by the international community, by the friends of Syria, and that is to stand by the Syrian people and to support the Syrian people um, to get to reach their goal in liberation and freedom in democratic country. And we are here today because that promise by the international community has not been fulfilled. 
um, what we need to do today and you know in 10 after 10 years after so many years in political negotiations in geneva and astana and, and else we know for sure that the assad regime is not willing to compromise um is not willing to actually submit to a political solution is not willing to share any any part of power in Syria with anyone else but the, you know, but himself and his family. So the only path forward left for the United States and for the international community is to give leverage for those who actually ask for freedom in 2011. To help you know, the Syrian opposition um, visualize for the Syrian people what is it like to actually live in a free democratic country. Um, you know, in Syria for so many years, um, Syrians have not been able to, for so many decades actually, Syrians have not been able to um, vote their ballots or to go to the ballots. Um, but the only time when they were, when they had the opportunity to, they voted with their feet. Um, over 8 million Syrians today are either in northwestern Syria or in Turkey. Um, another 4 million in northeast Syria and another 6 million are somewhere outside in, in neighboring countries um, as refugees. All of those people, the majority of the Syrian people have voted with their feet and they have chosen not to actually live under the Assad regime. And those people deserve an opportunity, deserve to be given the leverage, deserve to be given the support so they can actually visualize the vision they had in 2011 in a free and democratic country. So providing this essential support for, for Syrians, protecting the only enclave they have right now um, from Assad atrocities, from the bombardment of Russia and Iran, is essential to make sure that this is the leverage we can use against the Assad regime um, by actually supporting those actors, by bridging um, non the uh, actors against the Assad regime to actually, you know, unify our ranks and be able to support Syrians who actually have came to us and refused to live under the Assad regime. Um, that would require, you know, from the United States to actually engage fully diplomatically and in all other means back into the international community and back into the Syria talks. Um, throughout the past few years, we have seen um, continuous um, decrease in U.S. engagement regarding Syria, um, diplomatically or otherwise. Millions of people in, in northern Syria today live without um, sufficient support because of, you know, cut to programs, uh, whether it is to support local councils in Northwest Syria or cut to aid coming through OCHA, all of that because of that decrease in U.S. engagement. We want, we, we need, um, you know, the United States to go, to take back its international role um, in supporting the international community in uh, supporting the Syrian people to actually visualize the stream that we went out for in 2011. Thank you so much. Uh, let's take that question directly to Fred. Uh, you've heard what Kutaiba has said. You've heard what they are calling for. Is it something that the United States can lead the international community uh, to achieve? What would be the policy that you see at this moment, not 10 years ago at this moment, mm -hmm. that might have a chance of affecting positive change on the ground? And do you see the Biden administration pursuing any elements of that policy at all? Well, Josh, uh, uh, first of all, I'm honored to be part of this program, but Josh, I think it goes without saying that right now the, uh, the Biden administration is uh, engaging in a, uh, in a comprehensive interagency policy review about Syria. What do we want? How do we go about getting it? What kind of resources are we willing to uh, put up against it? Uh, you know, when you see the daunting list of priorities uh, facing this president, it becomes apparent, you know, notwithstanding all of our uh, collective uh, devotion to the Syrian interest here, it becomes understandable that the administration, uh, you know, would like to find a way to avoid this problem, if at all possible. It's not possible. It's just not possible. Uh, Syria's condition now is dire. It's a failed state. It's one where, uh, you know, 18 million Syrians, many of them are looking for ways to get out. If you can envision Assad still being on the scene with his entourage four years from now, it means that Syria's status as the, as the North Korea uh, of the Middle East will be thoroughly uh, solidified, and Syria will be a uh, profound uh, threat to the peace 
in the region and beyond. I think step one for the Biden administration is to recognize the seriousness of the problem, recognize that it impacts on the uh, national security interests of the United States, its allies, its partners, and, and first, first make, make the statement very clearly that the United States is going to adhere to an objective of full political transition in Syria. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to neutralize quickly uh, these various efforts going on in the region and around the world uh, you know, to somehow normalize things with Assad. Assad is the death of Syria. Uh, there is nothing to normalize. So I hope the administration starts out with a, with a clear statement of, uh, of its objective. Let me follow up with you quickly again, Fred. You know, the first inkling we saw of the Biden administration mentioning Syria at all was when uh, the Biden administration decided to bomb a couple of warehouses owned by a couple of Iranian militias who were allegedly involved in an attack on U.S. troops in Iraq. And the Biden team presented this to the American public as a policy measure to lessen the suffering both in Iraq and in Syria. What do you make of that? Uh, do you see that the Syria issue is becoming uh, a, a, a sub piece of the Iran diplomacy as we saw so many years ago? Do you think this is an alibi for a Syria policy or do you think it's the beginning of something bigger? Well, Josh, I'm afraid that more often than not, uh, you know, particularly during the Obama administration, uh, Syria policy was a subset of Iran. Uh, President Obama's top priority was to get the nuclear deal, fully understandable. Uh, but uh, he came to the conclusion that in order to get to that deal, I must do nothing uh, to upset the Iranians. Uh, and that was, a, uh, that was a profound mistake. Um, I think the most recent strike in, uh, in northeastern Syria uh, was was no more than a response, and I think probably an appropriate one, uh, to an attack on a on a U.S. facility in Iraq. I think the uh, overall policy towards Syria, uh, and Assad, of course, is is in the is in the center uh, of the uh, of the various policy dilemmas. I think that is still under review, and uh, I would not at this point, based on this one strike, uh, conclude that the Biden administration is boiling down uh, Syria policy to, uh, to what's happening in the Northeast. Got it, thank you. Naomi, if I could go to you. Um, for the last 10 years, I've watched and documented the US Holocaust Memorial Museum's uh, extensive efforts to help, doc to help preserve and ensure evidence of atrocities and to spread the, the, the awareness of these atrocities. Uh, I want you to first of all tell our audience why it is that the Holocaust Museum decided amongst all of the tragedies ongoing in the world, and there are surely many, uh, to focus so much time and attention and resources on the Syrian atrocities and uh, also talk about uh, what, what are the broader implications uh, for human rights around the world if these atrocities are not addressed and stopped and punished. Josh, uh, it's a real honor to be here, um, but the reality is that we shouldn't have to be here today marking this uh, horrific anniversary. And I think in part, that's part of the answer. Uh, the reason that we have become uh, so involved and committed is because as Kateva, Ambassador Hoff, and everyone who's already spoken has stated, we have been watching crimes unfold before our eyes in vivid detail, but have not seen action taken to protect lives. We've seen the gap between the rhetoric and reality of never again, and I dare say the hypocrisy of that commitment uh, rings so stark in the context of Syria. And if we think about the past decade, it's not just Syria, but Burma and the Rohingya, China and the Uyghurs, Iraq and the Yazidis. Uh, and we can't allow that to become the norm that we default to almost compassion fatigue or to, as Ambassador Hoff articulated in his comments, uh, acceptance of invoking all of the reasons why not to act, 
you know, in real time, these crimes have occurred. Uh, we've had ample time. We've had early warning to try to find innovative strategies to prevent and protect. And I really commend Ambassador Hoff and others, notably our, our Syrian colleagues, for whom the lives of their loved ones and their community rest on their shoulders. They are the heroes when the world has failed to uphold never again. Um, you know, one of the things that we always try to re remind people is that, you know, the moral reasons to save lives should be enough. But if we need to articulate all of the other arguments, the geopolitical arguments uh, that can be used to help compel action, Syria is a stark example that shows that every country can be impacted by the consequences of insufficient action. We've seen refugee flows, regional instability, geopolitical shifts that have helped to contribute to the rise of the far right, inform informed in part by our failure to act. You know, I went for the museum to Iraq to document the genocide committed by ISIS, in part because of the security vacuum that was allowed to fester in Syria. So sadly, we continue to live in a world where too little action is taken, often too late. And that just doesn't need to be the case. You know, each of you watching through your own actions can support the Syrians that you've met in this event, the organizations working to support them. You can call your members of Congress and, and say that you believe the US has a responsibility to protect. Um, one of the things that could be done of many is even just simply asking for someone uh, to be appointed to a position similar to what Ambassador Hoff held. And just very briefly, since you mentioned justice, I just wanna make two very quick points. The first is that the survivors are not going to give up. There will be no impunity for the crimes committed. We just saw a 95 year old uh, Frederick called Berger deported from Tennessee to Germany to face justice for crimes committed during the Holocaust. And the second is that the, we can't give up the testimonies that our Syrian colleagues are sharing, Kiteba, Omar, uh, so many, the photos that Caesar exposed, you know, for them it often feels like they're shouting into the wind unheard, but we just saw the first case of a perpetrator held accountable for crimes against humanity in Germany. We know that those stories, that evidence is going to make a difference. And I just wanna end by just acknowledging one person in particular, Mazen al-Hamada. Years ago, Sarah Afshar made an incredibly powerful documentary called Serious Disappear that told Mazen's story of trying to share the horrors of what he endured in Assad's detention facilities with the world. He was central to many of the cases that exist right now in Europe. His efforts are heroic as are so many of the people who have gone to such great lengths to talk about brutal things that no one should ever have to disclose. Just as so many Holocaust survivors, my grandparents included, had to share their experiences to help people truly believe the horrors that so many of us find totally incomprehensible yet are sadly all too real. And Liz Sly just movingly made public in a recent Washington Post article that Mazen returned to Syria and has been missing for the past year. We don't know where he is, but we do know that his experience, the experience of others have set in motion a wave of efforts to advance justice that will keep crashing down on the Assad regime and its supporters for decades to come. Thank you so much. Uh, Mazen, who is a friend to many on this panel, is a an example of a, a tragic story. And if you haven't read it, go to the Washington Post and read that story. An activist, a journalist, a survivor. Uh, tragically, he was lured back to Syria by what we believe to be agents of the Assad regime. And it hasn't been heard from since. And we wish him the best. But I'm wondering, just on that point, if I can now bring up to the stage Omar. Uh, Omar, are you with us? Yes, Josh. Hello. Thank you. So Omar, when I first met you years ago, that was when I became convinced that uh, there's the survivors of the Assad's atrocities will play a crucial role in uh, ensuring justice and accountability, which must come. But tragically, the, we do not always provide the support for these survivors that they need, and their suffering doesn't end when they are freed. And, and, and I'm just wondering if you can share with us your perspective on that important issue and tell our audience what we can do to help survivors like you, like Mazen, and like so many others. Yes. So um, my responsibility is to show some hope um, in the Syrian case, because if we Syrians don't have the hope, nobody else can have it for us. 
so I've tried to play this role and other survivors try to do that as well. Um, we've seen in Mazin's story that survivors are not getting enough support from where they are. It's like now we're talking survivors in the West, in Europe or in the US, they're not receiving this uh, support they need, which is pro problematic because any legal prosecutions, we're gonna start, we're gonna need those people to testify. And when we managed to protect Caesar, we inspired so many survivors to speak up, right? And that's why we managed to have a legal prosecution in Germany that sentenced one war criminal uh, to be in prison for four for, for and a half years. Um, and one important thing is that um, those people who've been most productive uh, are those who are still on the ground. So Maz and I are in touch with a small organization, non-registered organization on the ground in Syria. Few individuals who managed to use the corruption of the Syrian regime to smuggle, to get out more than 90 prisoners. That's much more than what the US government with all the power they have managed to get out of prisons in Syria, right? And the thing is those individuals need to be supported. Uh, and if, so those, those individuals still in Damascus, right? Uh, still in Syria, if we don't protect them, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna lose them and we're not gonna have a way to smuggle any more prisoners. You know how it works in Syria. You pay money, you get things, uh, but now money doesn't have the value as before. So people gotta gather thousands of dollars that they don't have, so they have to prioritize. Should I feed the rest of my kids or should I pay all the money I have sell my house to get one of my kids who's suffering inside certain detention centers. So the world plays a very important role right now in supporting those because we didn't, no country yet managed or had enough will to uh, liberate those prisoners. So let's at least support, support those who survived, who at least work for the justice process for the future. As a Syrian, I, I know that ju justice won't be achieved in, in one day or one year or, or five, uh, but it's important that we Keep, we keep documenting everything and using the evidence we have. So one day when the regime falls, we can prosecute them because otherwise the regime is actually targeting. And I told this story before, but the guard who tortured me in prison for one year and nine months called me and they didn't call me to, to have a nice conversation. He called me to threaten me to say, uh, if you don't shut up, I'm gonna kill you. And that's your address. And he gave me exactly my address where I live. And I was in Stockholm, Sweden. And that's like us thinking, oh, should I shut up? If I shut up, the regime will win. If I still speaking, I may be killed. That will even be even worse, right? It's like, what should I do uh, in this case? And start thinking about moving to the US. And that wasn't easy. So there's, there's no process that make it easier for survivors to, uh, to speak up at the same time and be safe. I don't feel safe completely safe, but I know I'll try to surround myself with the right people that will advise me all the time what to do in case of emergency. But Mazin did not have those people around him all the time. So he, he psychologically, he was broken because he did not see the changes he wished to see when he came to the US. He, you know, when you come, when I came to the Congress, I met some congressmen, I met, I testified in the Senate. I was so hopeful, you know, because, you know, the powerful people in the world, they're listening to me, everything's gonna change. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, fall the regime, all prison is gonna be out. And you testify and you go back home, you sleep very well, you wake up the other day and a few months later, one year later, nothing happened. You know, all the congressmen, the senators will come and shake hands and say, Omar, that's powerful. We all should take responsibility. And yeah, words, we need more actions. Thank you, Josh. Amen, thank you, Omar. Uh, let me go back to Kataiba now. Uh, you know, the whole world is dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and it's forced us all to look inward and to, the, unfortunately, the walls between our countries have been uh, built rather than taken down due to the, the, the virus and the tragedy that it spreads but we don't often hear about what it's like inside Syria. Tell us how the COVID pandemic has affected the crisis there. Uh, what is the situation for the innocent people in places like Idlib and Deir al-Zor, but also how has the Assad regime abused the pandemic to perpetrate its 
uh, horrendousness. First, thank you, Josh. I mean, unfortunately, um, COVID has hardest um, in areas like Syria, especially in areas in northern Syria and Idlib and other places. Um, because, I mean, for, for Syrians in their daily life, if you're not able to secure your daily food put on the table, secure shelter for your children, or protect yourself from, you know, indiscriminate bombardment coming from the skies, um, COVID or protection from COVID is the latest thing on anyone's mind, to be honest. Um, at the beginning, I remember not at midterm at the pandemic, the cost of just one disposable mask in Syria was um, almost 1,000 Syrian pounds at a time where basically you can buy, you know, one box of masks um, with a one month salary. Um, that is something that not, I mean, no one can afford not, you know, let itself, you know, let Syrians themselves do it. Um, so it has been really drastic. I mean, personally for us, you know, we talk, you know, on daily basis with, you know, with, uh, with Syrians inside in regime areas or, um, in Northwest and Northeast. Um, and on daily basis in my conversations, I always have to start with sending my condolences to the people I talk to because I hear of their relatives, um, their family members, or their best friends who have died because of COVID. Um, what of course have you know, made this thing worse is the, is the lack of management, at least to say, um, by the Assad regime, by the Assad government. Um, you know, even before the, before the uprising, what led us to the uprising was the mismanagement of the Assad regime, not only on, you know, um, because of, you know, the lack of freedoms or, you know, um, the lack of management politically, the lack of, you know, uh, uh, liberal, liberal rights, but also the lack of management and care for Syrians in general. In 2007 and 2008, Syria was hit with, with one of the hardest droughts um, in 100 years. Um, and people were literally starving in East Aleppo province and in their resort. What was the um, government response at the time? They organized an event for um, Guinness record for the longest kebab um, in the world um, at the same time where people were starving to death. So we see, we see that continuously throughout the last 10 years, um, the regime, instead of using chlorine to clean hospitals and clinic, it used it to actually produce chemical weapons to kill people instead of helping them. And those policies continue to be in place. Um, and during the, during the pandemic, the government basically put punishment on doctors who would report any case of COVID officially um, without sending reference to the Ministry of Health. So doctors have to say that, you know, um, if, you have, if you have COVID symptoms, then you, it's just an asthma or it's, you know, um, it's some type of flu, you know, that you couldn't even report if this is COVID or not. And that actually explains um, the lack of, you know, the, the low official numbers the Syrian government is reporting when it comes to COVID. Um, in other areas, um, if we want to compare, to be honest, um, organizations like the White Helmets have, have been doing enormous job in um, fighting the pandemic, providing care to people, um, providing protection as much as they can, um, to the extent that it is um, actually permissible in a situation where you have crowded refugee camps or where people, as I said, are looking for their daily, um, for their daily food to put on the table. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Moaz Mustafa from the Syrian Emergency Task Force to come in here and talk about specifically the situation on the ground in Idlib. Moaz. Thank you, Josh. Um, you know, we, we recently, the Syrian Emergency Task Force released, uh, and happy to share it with whoever would like it, a, a list of seven policy recommendations that we're utilizing in advocacy. At the top of that list is you know, the United States leading to, to, to get to a negotiated settlement and an end to the killing in Syria. And at the top of that list is the protection of Idlib. And the reason that Idlib is so high on the list is because I just want everyone to remember that in Northwest Syria, Idlib represents all of Syria. People from Aleppo and Damascus and Homs and Deir Zor and Dara um, that were shipped in green buses um, when they didn't kneel to Assad or escaping detention or killing uh, or forced conscription went there. And so Idlib's population is double the size of its original residence. And in Idlib right now, it's an ever shrinking space surrounded by Iran and its backed militias, including Hezbollah and, and a list of others that we can uh, also provide, as well as the Russian military and air force and the Assad regime forces. What's really important to remember about Idlib 
it's not merely about the fact that it will likely be the earliest test of the Biden administration, and also the fact that it has the highest risk of mass atrocities that will dwarf other mass atrocities we've seen even in Syria in the past 10 years. Um, it also has the ability to double the refugees in Europe. It will also, if taken by the Assad regime, will allow Assad, Russia, and Iran to focus wholeheartedly on hurting our US troops and partner forces in order to pressure a withdrawal from Syria. But most importantly, if we allow Assad to kill, detain, or displace the millions of civilians, a million of them kids in Idlib province, that would essentially be the death knell of any potential political solution that would result in, in, in exactly what Ambassador Hobb described as the North Korea of the Middle East, because then the Assad regime can declare victory and wait out US withdrawal. And then the Assad regime, we have at the same time, will be able to not have be held accountable for the crimes. None of the refugees will ever return to regime held areas and now they won't even have Idlib to return to. Um, and so it actually hurts that number one negotiated settlement if we let Idlib go. At the same time, if we protect Idlib, mean, not meaning deploying troops or, or engaging in a major military intervention, we have Turkey, a NATO ally that has been okay with sending its own troops. It lost 33 uh, or 34 service uh, men from the Turkish military, uh, NATO military uh, this time last year trying to stop this big military offensive, which by the way, resulted in this tentative ceasefire that's continuously being breached. We must make clear diplomatically and with our allies, the Europeans and Turkey in this case in Northwest Syria, that the people in the protection of Idlib, uh, people in Idlib is something we will not uh, sort of waver on. At the same time, ensuring that, that, that the sanctions through targeted executive orders and the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act are focused in a way that it hurts the Assad regime's ability to finance that military uh, uh, operations in Idlib. Um, and I think at the end, and, and in doing both of these things and in providing logistics and intelligence to our NATO allies on the ground, we can, without military intervention, make clear that Idlib is, for lack of a better word, a red line, and that will be conducive to a negotiated settlement. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Moss. Uh, this next question comes from the audience, from Greg Shea. I'm going to uh, uh, call on Ambassador Hoff to answer it. So get ready, Ambassador Hoff. The question is, what is the role of the ICC in addressing si the Syrian situation, the International Criminal Court? And if Biden can change, it's a two-part question, if Biden can change the status of Venezuelan refugees, could he do the same for Syrian refugees? So I guess two questions there, the ICC, and what can the Biden administration do for refugees? My uh, my suspicion, Josh, is that uh, is that the ICC probably uh, will not be a uh, a critical player on the uh, on the accountability front. Um, I I think the most important priority uh, for the Biden administration right now is to uh, is to is to reinforce. Uh, our own accountability evidence and uh, accountability activities in terms of uh, making sure that uh, that evidence is uh, is secured, and also making it clear to the Russians right now uh, that the days of U.S. passivity in the face of uh, in the face of regime mass atrocity activities those days are over. Uh, that the United States, if faced with mass homicide uh, activities by the regime, whether in Idlib or somewhere else, the United States will respond uh, militarily at times and places of its choosing. I think we need to make this very clear up front. One thing we can give the Trump administration credit for uh, in its military responses to two chemical assaults is that it did not lead to uh, invasion, occupation, uh, World War III, <laughs> or, or any of the things uh, we were constantly warned about uh, during, the, uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to say never again, and we need, we need to mean it this time. Excellent, thank you, sir. It's worth noting here that Syria is not a party to the ICC, uh, and therefore, uh, in order to be subject to it, a referral would be 
needed from the UN Security Council and uh, Russia would surely veto any referral. Uh, let me go now to Naomi and ask her uh, to follow up on this issue of justice and accountability. You know, what does history tell us about uh, the importance of truth and justice and accountability for war crimes as it relates to the goal of peace, but more importantly, uh, what will we see in this century if there's no justice and accountability and punishment for the atrocities in Syria today? Thanks, Josh. You know, as I mentioned, uh, we know that the victims themselves will not rest until those who have committed the crimes are held responsible. And core to the mission of the museum is to try to do for communities today what was not done for Jews during the Holocaust. That includes ensuring that individuals like Omar and others uh, are able to have a seat at the table to identify how justice can be pursued. You just mentioned the challenges with the ICC. Um, we have other avenues that are available. We're seeing countries hold individuals who are resident in those countries. Uh, they might have come as refugees. They might have immigrated uh, responsible for perpetrating crimes against humanity. We've now seen that happen in Germany with the first successful case uh, where an individual was held responsible as being um, an accessory to the commission of those crimes for torture. We have other cases that are underway. We have cases uh, that are being taken forward through universal jurisdiction. The Canadian government just uh, recently reiterated a call for the UN General Assembly to, through the UN Convention Against Torture, uh, examine the different ways to hold the Assad regime accountable. So we're seeing growing momentum, not just from survivors, but also from governments that are willing to extend the political will to hold Assad responsible. So I think what the future looks like, what the next few decades look like, is that the Assad regime, much like the former Nazis who tried to flee, are going to have to be looking over their shoulder every single day, wondering whether or not uh, they will be picked up as they travel abroad, um, if change occurs within the country, whether or not they're going to be held responsible in domestic courts, ideally, uh, or in regional courts that are developed. Because I think that though we have seen a failure to act in terms of stopping the killing, what we continue to see is sustained investment in collecting evidence, preserving evidence, analyzing that, building cases. And then as soon as there are opportunities for cases, that material is being used to hold people accountable. So governments are putting the money and now increasingly their political will behind trying to find avenues to prosecute abroad and making sure that we have the evidence needed so that in 10 years, 20 years, 60 years, people will be held responsible. And what do we know about what that means for societies? We know that unless a society reckons with its past, unless it comes to term and acknowledges the commission of crimes, we will only see either a continue tearing of the social fabric between different communities or the risk of recurrence. What happened in Syria did not start with the uprising. The commission of torture that Sam, Omar, Teba, others have spoken about was a pattern of behavior that Assad used, Assad's father used. Assad's father was able to do so without any consequences. Uh, we cannot allow his son to continue to get away with these crimes today. And I think that uh, that is what the, the future will, we're gonna see innovation, we're gonna see uh, new avenues for justice. Uh, and I really truly believe that this is one area where uh, there is a, a bit of a ray of hope uh, and a bit of a silver lining too, because the rest of the world will, will benefit from those innovations that are made when it comes to justice and accountability in the context of Syria, but again, it's born off the backs of the Syrian people themselves, their experiences and their efforts to document, smuggle out the evidence. They're the ones whose lives are on the line to even pursue this work that is being done on justice and accountability. Well, there you have it. Without an end to the atrocities, there can be no end to the war. And without truth and justice and accountability, there can be no sustain sustainable peace. Uh, to those in the audience, it's not too late. Uh, thank you for listening, but please do not turn away from this never again moment. For those in Syria, you are not forgotten. Thank you all for participating.